<laughs> so I'm, I'm honored to be with Haley. She's the real pro in the international. Haley has teams all over the world. Um, but my experience, I, I'm uh, one, one of the owners, but I have lived and worked in many countries in the world of direct selling. I worked for about 20 years for a company called New Skin, and for New Skin I opened about 30 different international markets. So I've seen a lot of things that work, things that are a challenge in terms of direct selling. And then, uh, and with that, I lived in Hong Kong, I lived in Tokyo, Japan, and I lived in Shanghai, China for four years. So I've done a lot, a lot of experience in Asia, but I've also opened European markets and South American markets. And with doTERRA, Specifically, I was involved, I was responsible for opening Japan early on, and, and Korea, um, and China, and today I oversee Australia, and Southeast Asia, and China, and that's the part of the world that I focus on helping. Dave and I kind of split the global world of, of doTERRA, and it's kind of split by size in terms of issues. So he has Japan, Korea, and then Europe and South America, and I have uh, the other market. Mark Wolfert, one of my partners, works on opening new markets for us, but I work very closely with him. So I, I'm going to turn some time to Haley to explain her organization and her experience of working internationally, um, which has mostly been with doTERRA, right? And, and she can talk a little bit about that. And then what I'd like to do is really just open it up to questions that you might have. I, I can. We can give tips for an hour, we can give suggestions, or we can answer questions. And I think answering your questions is really the most productive thing. But Haley? Yeah, hey ahead. guys. So um, I have about only 45% of my team in the US. So the majority of my team is actually international. Um, this is my daughter Madeline, who's had the opportunity to She's travel doing sign internationally. She's interpreting for any for web. She's helping web. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got um, about a third of my team in, in Australia and about twenty, almost twenty percent maybe in, um, in 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 Europe, all over Europe, and actually European founder, and um, almost ten percent in Canada. So I'm probably leaving about forty percent in the U.S. But I have an unusual perspective on building internationally. I really don't encourage people, even though it sounds crazy, I don't really encourage people to build internationally unless they have a leader that they know is committed to really going in and doing it. I think there's two successful ways to build international. One is you are literally living abroad and you are on the ground there literally building internationally or the other is, is you have a connection with somebody who speaks your language over here and they go over or they're living there and they're using you as the mentor and, um, and they're building internationally. And as a result, you're building internationally. So I will say that my first trip to Australia ever in my life was when my, di when my Australian hit diamond. I never went over until she hit diamond. And my first trip over to Europe, not in my life, I've been to Europe before. My, my aunt actually has been living in Switzerland for about 40 or 50 years. So. We, we, would, we would travel a lot internationally to Europe. My first trip for doTERRA was not until, I, I think we were founders in Europe. And so I think that kind of says a lot, because I don't encourage people to, I think there's so many things we can do these days in technology. And I, you know, I see people traipsing over and spending thousands and thousands of dollars. And you know, I, I will let you know that not everything that you put energy into works out. And it's, it is devastating to put your time and your finances into a situation where it may not take off and get off to the ground. So I, I do think there's a lot you can do from where you're living. And I also think that um, you know if you're going to go the global access route or even if it's not, um, in a country that's not open yet, uh, you've got a you've got to have some tough skin, I think. That's not an avenue that I wanted to do. I prefer to you know wait until the until the company is ready, and you've got a leader that's ready, and then you know do some more things together. Great. Let me um hold this close, right? So let me uh, let, let me address that for just a minute. And I I agree 100% with Haley. And I've seen in my life 
uh, people who I've had, even leaders, big leaders, Blue Diamonds, presidential, say, what country should I move to? And I'm like, just where you are, where you live, right? Just stay where you live, right? I, I have seen very few people succeed. Uh, I'm not gonna say it never works, but I've seen very few people succeed who, who try to just go to a country who don't already have a great team that's already been built there. Just even if they have one connection and they just go to this country, it's just hard. And and so as Haley said, there's a lot that can be done. And it's unfortunate because it's expensive. And you know, if you already have a reason to be in a country, no problem. But if you're gonna just go to a country to build Doterra, I would wait until you have an organization there. I want to mention uh, just quickly, I know we have people at various levels here of understanding and uh, very experienced and some newer people. I, I think there's a lot of confusion among the doTERRA ranks and particularly the younger group or the newer group about what global access really means, right? So can I explain that for just a minute? What global access and what that means. We operate in a lot of countries around the world, doTERRA already. So if you're gonna go to Japan or you're gonna go to Canada, um, which is Canada a different country, by the way? Oh, sorry. Yes, very much so. Sorry. <laughs> it's a different country when they want to be a different country, but you can come and join with us on this trip, right? It's a good thing. I'm joking. Um, so, I'm joking. But we're, when we're established in a country, we have a process for people to sign up, they can buy products, they can buy products in their local currency, they can get paid commissions in their local currency, and, and it, it's as if doTERRA were right there in the country. In some countries we have an office. In Canada we don't have an office to visit, but you buy products and you're, you pay in Canadian dollars and you're paid in Canadian dollars. They can also buy from the U.S. if they want, but that's a separate process. We call that uh, vernacular, if you hear in the company people talking about that, OTG. So it's on the ground. We have an on the ground presence there. And, and you know, so you have to ask yourself when you want to go to a country, is doTERRA on the ground? Are we there? Can we, people buy in the currency? Can they receive a commission in the currency? We do that through most of Europe today, we do it in Mexico today, we do it in Costa Rica today, we, we're going to be soon in Colombia and Ecuador, we do it in Canada, um, we do it in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, in most all of Asia, Singapore and Malaysia, we don't yet in the Philippines, we don't yet in Thailand, we don't yet in Indonesia or India. And then we are in Australia on the ground and in New Zealand on the ground. So, um, and we've announced um, to our leadership team that this year we're going to move on the ground in um, Colombia and Ecuador and Guatemala. It's a little different issue. We've been there for a while, but Guatemala. And then we are going to be on the ground in um, Russia, Brazil, and we're hoping by the end of the year to be on the ground in South Africa and in the Philippines. Okay, so these are the countries where we're on the ground. Now, every other country that I haven't mentioned is what we call a global access country. And what that means is that anyone from that country, I'll use as an example Qatar. Okay, anyone want to go to Qatar or there? any one of those countries, right? If you know somebody in that country, they can sign up in global access. And it sounds wonderful, they can sign up, and but they need a, a, a shipping point in the US, okay? They need a shipping point in the US because we don't ship to them, and we don't pay commissions to them, but they can sign up, and they sign up with an address in Qatar, but they're, global access, okay? So when we talk about global access, we don't provide services to them. You do. <laughs> and as Haley said, it's not easy. It's very hard. So global access is really designed for 
I've got family in this country or my downline's got family, they're traveling there frequently because you, you order the products for them, they order them and they're shipped to a US address and then you as leaders have to get them the product and, and they'll accrue a commission but we can't pay them in Qatar or wherever it may be and so they'll accrue what we call an, an AR balance or a, a bank account at doTERRA and then in time, if you want, if they want to be paid, we'll pay you and then you got to pay them, right? It's an expense of your business. So it comes to you in a 1099 as income, but, but then you get to expense it because it's just an expense to them. But I'm just saying, it, you do the work and we don't do that work uh, because we're not ready to really import. And the reason we do that is because if we try to ship products into Qatar from the company, I just use that as an example, Qatar is kind of a unique Middle Eastern country, but if we try to ship it in, they will block it every time. But if you ship it in as a gift or a personal something, then you have the ability to get it in much better than we do. Or, or it's hard, it's hard. You just have to know. Some places where they have global access, they're, they're hand carrying it in, in luggage, right? They're going in once or twice a month or every other month and they're taking people's orders down and, and it's a lot of work. So I, I mean, I agree with Haley that in general, it's better to wait till we're on the ground in terms of a tip. But if you want to go to a place where we're not, you can do it through global access and that's what global access is. So you become the company to make that happen. And I will tell you, in the past, China started this way for us. We had a leader. Uh, one of our presidential diamonds, David Chung, who started his own business to ship products into this country, into China. And he developed a whole system to do it. And it was cumbersome. And he will tell you right now today that it was a pain. And he did not make any money on this. In fact, he invested a lot in it. Shipments didn't always get there. He had to ship buy and ship extra products to people. It was a nightmare. Now he has a big team in China, okay, today, but he's invested a ton to make that happen. And now those people just buy from our office in China. We look at, one of the things we do, among many ways that we look at a country that we're going to take on the ground, we do look a little bit at global access volume, right? So we, we see where some volume is, and then we say, oh, well, there's something going on here. And we have a team back in our corporate office that you can contact. Um, Cameron Legere runs this team. And, and they're always talking to people. We're, we're not helping get products in, but we just want to know what's happening. We want to answer questions. And when we see that there's interest in a particular country, that's one of the reasons why we'll move that up on the list. If we have five or six silvers in a country that are growing, we're going to take it more seriously than if we just have 20 random customers. And so. We, we do look at that. But are there any other questions about global access? Do you want to comment, Haley, other than don't it, not ever do it? Yeah, I mean, I, it, it is a lot of work. And what I've seen in a lot of countries is that the reason that doTERRA is not there is not because not necessarily they don't have a presence, but it's because nothing can get past the borders, nothing can get through customs. People are stealing packages. You know, a lot of the countries are are not the most ethical when it comes to doing business with them. The reason that they're not there, or terror that is, is because there's a lot of legislation that has to happen to get the products labeled correctly, et cetera, you know, and legal in that country. And I mean, sometimes that, that work is still being done after we're over to the country. It's not even, it's not even like well, completely. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, <laughs> always. I, there's, not, there's, not, there's not one country anywhere that has as many and every product the U.S. has, right? I mean, it just takes, there's a, there's a tremendous effort that goes into labeling and getting everything compliant. And then, you know, we then have to set up the computer systems. And you know, we've gone through a lot of issues on the computer and we can only feel like we can execute on so many countries at a time. And we're fighting off a lot this year with Colombia, Ecuador, Guatemala, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, and the Philippines. That's a lot, and we're getting some pushback, but in our team, but we're dealing with it, and and we're going to make that happen. But that's why we can't be in Bolivia this year, right? People want 
They get a question about every country. Some leader, really, can we go to Bolivia? Well, not this year, right? It's either Brazil or Bolivia. I'm sorry, we're going to Brazil, right? It's, it's, it's one step at a time. And so, anyway. Yeah, and, um, you know, even when, a, even when the country is open on the ground, just so you guys know, it's a lot of work in the beginning, getting the company up and running and working with corporate and working with your leaders over there. So, you know, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that you're probably not going to have any uh, material and language, right, that you're working with over there. So, it's a big effort and you have to be super patient and there's going to be, there are going to be inevitably a lot of things that happen when the country is open that are not um, the way that you want them to happen, like worse than not being able to get holiday items because the system falls apart. <laughs> that kind of stuff's actually going to be happening like every week, you know, in the country that's just start opening. So, I mean, it's not something that I would do, to be honest, unless I, I unless maybe I was from another country and had a massive amount of people or family over there and was traveling back and forth and knew that eventually they were coming and it was really soon and then maybe you could get the people trapped over there. Yeah, I know you said you waited until they hit diamond. At what rank do you think would be the earliest you'd ever consider? I think it depends consider? on what your, what your level It's an, on of, an open country. Yeah, on, on an open country? No, on an open, on like an open Australia country. and New I think it's a personal preference. I mean, look, I mean, we're all busy, right? So yeah. it's, and you have to decide how you're gonna spend your time. And for me, um, you know, now when I look at my team, it's very interesting. You know, I look at it, I go, oh my gosh, 65% of our team is like, or 65% of our team is, is not in the country, like maybe I shouldn't be living in the US anymore. <laughs> maybe I should go to the US. Right, 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 right. So you have to decide where you want to spend your time. Just because, look, I, I, I'm a double presidential diamond. I have 13 legs across my front line. I've got multiple qualifiers and other legs. I probably have 20 people that are enrolled to me that are platinum or above the presidential diamond. And I have seen a lot of legs fall apart. Mm -hmm. I have seen a lot of legs fall apart. And not just elite legs, and not just silver legs. I have seen platinums walk away. So for me to go spend a couple thousand dollars on an airplane ticket and uh, you know a week of time away from my family, you, you gotta really show me that you're doing something to make that investment. If you're interested in traveling to a country, that's something that you wanna do with your family and you're gonna spend some time there. And oh, by the way, we're gonna call this a business trip and you know teach some classes over there, then great, go for it. But for me, you know, I, I was in my 40s and Australia had never been on my agenda and okay, now I have diamond and I saw things were happening. It was, it was, a, it was a country I wanted to visit. So at that point I, made, I decided to make the trip. Does that help? Yes. You had a question. I wanted to um, see if you can clarify, if you're in a country that is the GAC um, yeah. and you mentioned paying, because we have a couple people that want to build in Brazil and in Russia. Great. So you're paying us and we're going to Today, pay. no, let me explain. So I don't want to confuse anyone. So when we're in the GAC mode, if they want to be paid, global access mode, then, then we would pay you if, if they want to be paid. They would accumulate an AR balance. And once they got a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars, if they want to be paid, they would contact the company. This is our international department, Cameron Legier, and with you and you know together we want to make sure that yeah. they agree you agree okay we, we would cut a check to you and you would pay them however Brazil and Russia are moving to OTG and we'll be on the ground there by you know April May June and we'll be paying people then so I wouldn't do it now because we're already going to be paying them does that but make in sense meantime, like in the meantime if you have people there and they want to be paid we can do that, but even then, we would say, well, we're gonna pay them in two months, so yeah. just wait till we get open, because it's much easier that way. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yes? I have a question about the payment. So, the, the builder then like signs like a co-sign with the, the wellness advocate that's in the different country, and that's and then it pays through their commission checks? Like, Correct. Okay, right. Correct. So we just have, if you have a downline in a country yeah. and they got a commission, I mean, we're not going to do this for $10, okay? But yeah. once they accumulate $1,000, $2,000 in earnings, we would cut a check to you okay. and then you would pay them, okay. right? And through PayPal, whatever, you manage it however you want. We're not getting involved in that transaction, right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
because it's much harder for a company to get involved in a transaction than an individual to get involved in a transaction like that. So, anyway, that's been our process, yes? But they have a, a U.S. account. Why do we have to call... Well, if they have a U.S. bank account, then that's fine, okay? But they usually will not... They just have set up an, a U.S. account, a GAC account on doTERRA, but they don't have residency in the U.S. They don't have a U.S. bank account, right? They just have a, a doTERRA account that's a GAC account. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when we're enrolling in Brazil... Yeah. Right now, we need our address. That's the address because they don't have a residency. I mean, you don't need. They just need. They need an address. They need an a U.S. address, and then you ship to them. But they have a separate account number, and and they're flagged in our system to know they're in Brazil, and we're keeping track of all that. So you can ship to them. You can ship to them individually, and you know, with a country like Brazil, you're going to have to open up their box, and you're going to have to break it in. You know. You figure it out. Yeah. And Brazil is very complicated. Up, Some countries it's down. quite easy, and other countries it's very complicated. Or a lot of a lot of there are shipping like places where yeah. you, they, you know people just ship directly to a shipper, and then they know what to do, and they repack it depending on where they're yeah. shipping it to, and they know how to repack it so it gets through customs, and there's a fee on top of it. So now you're shipping instead of being three ninety nine, it's twenty dollars, yeah, sixty dollars. <laughs> yeah, and if you and if you're interested, you can. Talk to our international team, Cameron Legier is his name. And sometimes he knows of a shipper that's working and doing that in a country that leaders are successful with. Sometimes they don't, and you have to figure it out. It's really, any time you go to a new country, it's, it's a very pioneering spirit, you have to understand. It's, you know, in the US, we're, we're, we're large, we have tools. And one of the things I think you'll find that's the most difficult, that's frustrating for us as a company, to be honest, um, is that we can translate materials, but honestly, our materials aren't as good as Haley's materials, okay? Well, it's not that. It's, it's you know, but, when you're in each country, it's yeah. the culture. The yeah. culture is very different. So I have, I get what he's saying, like, you know... My, but I, but you, you do it in the U.S. Like, if you guys, I would ask all of you, if you go through the list and say... What materials, what information has really been helpful for you in the U.S.? A lot of times it's not the company brochure, okay? It's some blog, some website, some information that's all in English. And that's why in Australia, Haley knows this, the Australians just jump onto the U.S. sites, right? They get all the information from the U.S. websites. Well, it's tougher when you're in a different country where they don't speak the language. But even right? in Australia, the culture is so different, it is different that they've actually rewritten, like they don't even Some use our empowered success stuff. Like yeah. a lot of, the, they want to write it in their own, they change words, they change terminologies, they, you know, certain words that we don't think are offensive to them, like, you know, a lead, right, or, 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 or push to, to premiere, like those words are not their culture. They, even in the English language, it's very bizarre, right? So yeah. they, my, my Europeans, they, they take what I've done, but they completely translate it their way, you know, so that it, it fits and it sure. feels appropriate. Okay, other questions? Yes, over here. Haley, what's yeah. been your secret to recruiting in Europe? Recruiting leaders? Um, you know, I think with me, leaders found me. So one of the things that I have done since I started doTERRA was I've been really interested in uh, building my own brand and I don't I feel like doTERRA is an extension of me it's not me so I think that people are out there not only googling essential oils but they're looking for certain qualities in a leader or in a profession or in a you know something that can help them feel good emotionally and I've been lucky that that's worked, and I have had people find me, and then I've been able to get them up and running. I wasn't purposely targeting. In fact, I mean, it's kind of a funny story. I was at a convention like four years ago, and Sean Price came up to me and said, oh, by the way, you know, you're going to be founders next month. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I had no idea that, you know, the volume had progressed to that extent. I wasn't purposely trying to do it. And it just worked out. And so when I see, when I, and this is just with anybody, whether it's 
in Europe or whether it's in Australia, whatever country it is, you know, look, we we all know that you know, the 80 to 20 rule, right? You, you spend 80% of your time on the 20% that are working with you. And so I look and I just notice. I'll give everybody my material and then the people that are, are running with it and making it go, like you said, when should I go to Europe? Well, when you see somebody running towards you and they're in the top 20%. And so that's what happened with my European leaders. And one of them, just customer told me she was never going to do anything. And boom, like a year later, she's got you know, 700,000 TV in Romania where we had nothing. And so you just never know what's going to pop and what's not. You just keep your eyes open. And then you, and then you spend your energy where you see it producing. Let me just comment. And that I concur completely with Haley, but we're not all Haley Hobson. Okay? And my experience has been, and what I've seen in leaders and in, in being involved with direct selling for a long time, and with doTERRA, is that it's best to continue to work in your home market and find people who have connections already into those foreign markets, okay? Um, I'll give you the example of uh, our China business today. Okay, um, a large portion of our China business is under David uh, and Stephen Shum. And the way that came to be was that Boyd Truman um, knew David from a long time ago. David was living in LA. And Boyd drove to LA and went and talked to him in LA. They had been friends from 20 years ago, someone who he knew back from when he was a young man. And, and he went and cultivated that relationship in the United States. And then it was David who went and, and built the business in Taiwan. And then Boyd, of course, worked with him. And Boyd spoke some Chinese, which helped, and there's other things. But you, you've got to look within, in the United States, we just have a melting pot of people from all over. We had um, dinner tonight with one of Haley's people who lived in um, Coney Island area of New York, which I've lived in that area before. And, and I know that there's a lot of uh, Russian Jews that live in that area. And if she continues to build in that area, she's going to find people who are then going to be able to go to Russia. And she can support them and, and teach them and then let them go do it because they're connected. They have the language. It's just so hard to go into a foreign country pretty cold. And, and there's connections right here in the United States. Well, I'm Dominican, but in the United States, that we can work. I, I've often said to people that if I wanted to build an international business, and I'm not, I'm like Haley, I'm, it sounds exciting, and ultimately as you grow, you'll have an international business, but I would just, you know, if you teach a class, and there's 30 people in the class, and, and one of them's from another country, just spend a little bit of extra time with that person, okay? Just spend a little bit of extra time to see who they are, to help them be successful, because you never know what doors can open in another country based on that. And, and there's ways to do that in a country that we're currently in. Obviously, it's easier if you find someone in Europe, you find someone from France or from Italy, great. It's easy for them to get started. If they're from a more difficult country where we're at GAC, then you have to really start to evaluate you know, is it the right time? Let's build in the United States first and help them build in the United States and then, then go to the foreign market. And one of the things is that you, I don't know if you guys picked up on in my business, which is interesting, is that every country I'm in is English, I mean, not that in the Netherlands, but um, is an English speaking predominant country. So Australia, New Zealand, Canada. My leader in, in the Netherlands is, is, speaks five languages, and English is one of her primary languages. In Romania, my leader is actually right now living in New Jersey and speaks fluent English. So it was easier to deal with that when there was no language barrier. So I, I don't know what would have happened if, I don't know if I would have done it if it was, you know, I don't, I don't speak any other languages embarrassingly. Yeah. Yeah. You got a question? I did have a question. So um, my team has sort of had that perfect scenario where we had a connection in Italy and the UK, and it Great. has now turned into almost a silver leg. Good. which is awesome, but we're having difficulties trying to support and mentor them. Any advice that you could give around how to best do that without actually physically going there, um, which I agree is an investment and I don't think we're there yet, but there's technology and we do FaceTimes and all that other fun stuff, but 
Any other suggestions that you would have? I, I will make one, then I'll turn it to the pro, because she's the one who does this, okay? Um, one of the beautiful things about doTERRA is if you continue to give them great support, um, you can connect them to another team and be safe, okay? And, and if you involve the country uh, manager or the, the, set, the people, like in the UK, for instance, we have a team in, outside of London and Milton Keynes now, and, and if you involve them, okay? And we've done that. Great. And so, they know who they are, and yeah. then they can connect them to other teams. <laughs> the biggest challenge with this in some countries, by the way, is, uh, well, I don't want to get into this, but it's cross-recruiting where all of a sudden, whoa, they went silent, and you find out they're a, a diamond on someone else's yeah. team, right? You don't want that to happen. If you involve the office, and, and our, our corporate people know what's happening, you really decrease your chances of that happening. And we don't, in doTERRA versus my other company, the instances of that are very small. And so if you're open, even with, even if you know the upline of people who are there, if you talk to the office, who, who has other teams there, and you talk to them and they know, people are, are not gonna steal them from you. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, so connect them to other teams is one of the suggestions I have. But Haley, go ahead. She's the pro. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a good one. I mean, if you had come to me and said, hey, I've got, if you have a leader in the UK, then I would connect you with my leader. And the way that most, I mean, pretty much if you're a presidential diamond, you have an international team, probably. And so you are connected to somebody who's got a team somewhere else. And, uh, you know, and, now, and, and Haley, even as strong as Haley is, I mean, fastest growing, she wins this trip every year, whatever, even as presidential, she, she has her team, even her team, she will tell you, in Australia, even when she was there and she went, but they got support from another team as well. Yeah. So that happens, even, so don't feel bad about that, even Haley has that, but yet she supports people from other teams as well. Right. And so leaders understand that and they, they will be open to yeah, that. Yeah, I have somebody right now who I've been speaking to for the last couple of weeks who's Canadian, who's from the Philippines, and he's, you know, concerned that we're not in the Philippines yet, and he's heard that people are in the Philippines, and I said, who do you hear is in the Philippines, and the conversation's been like, don't worry, we're, we'll get you into those meetings, like, it's not going to be a problem, you know, if they're on another team, we all do that for mm -hmm. each other, um, but the thing, I, I mean, the biggest thing is just wrapping your head around the time zone, you know, yeah. I, I think if you can figure out, you know, what the time zone is that works, like, you just have to get up early, mm -hmm. you know, you have to get up early, if you want to deal with the Europeans, you've got to get up early, and you've got to do your meetings early in the morning, um, you know, or by, you know, noon, and then they feel like you're on their time zone. It, it's, it's when they, they feel the lack of presence that it's, it's challenging, you know. It's when they feel that lack of presence. So for me, you know, I try to do everything at noon mountain time. So, you know, London's hit, getting hit at 7, and Central Europe is getting hit at 8, and, you know, Eastern Europe is getting hit at 9, and they, they can adjust to that, and then just whether you've got, a, I've got, for me, on my team, I've got a European Facebook group, so it's like, for all of my teams in Europe, and then, you know, we sometimes make chats going on in specific countries, and, you know, now we've, I've taken certain, some of my silver and golds and above to, in, into a Slack workspace, so they're all, even if they're in different countries, they're working together, and you... Slack's just an application tool, like, yeah. like Facebook. Like Facebook, like Facebook yeah. communication okay. tool, but more targeted, searchable, and um, you know, having that, I do Zooms with them, so that's a great way to communicate. And if you, I don't know, I only use an iPhone, but on iPhone we have the iChat, which is Wi-Fi, so I can yeah. text with them all day long, or a lot of them like to use WhatsApp in Europe. And if you're, you're on those communication channels, it's, it's easy with technology, it's free to talk to them these days. Yeah, we, Boxer's our friend. Boxer's great. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, uh, be, be aware of what the tool is they use in that country. Thanks, John. Yeah. And then if you're in Taiwan or China, you want to use Line. Line's a big deal over there. Yeah. Or Thailand. You've got to find yeah. what their tool is and be present on that tool. I, I would also say that, and, and this goes to Haley, uh, to complete some of her story, you mentioned, you know, what, uh, what level do I go over there and when do I go over. When you do make that first trip, uh, one of the best times to do it is around when the country's having a convention there, right? And to get, and I think you had mentioned when you went to your diamond the first time in Australia, it was at the convention, right? And even though 
it's a long story, you don't have to get into. The diamond was sick and couldn't even come, but she met with all of their team, right? And was able to support the team because the diamond couldn't be there, so she became the applying to help the team, right? So, so really build the momentum around when the convention is or a meeting in that country that you can participate. You don't have to carry all the freight yourself, right? You got a great big event and excitement, things happening that you can just build on, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I pretty much only go over these days. I mean, I go over a lot, but it's always attached to, you know, I go to Australia on around the Australian convention. You know, we'll do a little vacation before or after, and we'll, you know, do some meetings beforehand, and then I go to Europe during the fall tour, and then I go to Europe during the convention, and then we do the presidential trip. It's always been east for the last couple of years, so we attach on a little bit. So it's always, we're already there, or, you know, there's a big event going on, and it's, it's, it's easier. You can, you can get a lot done, and everybody's excited. You can meet with the people, and you know, that's good mind success. Yeah. I have a question. Sure. So, with building a mind, um, Australia is kind of just the only one I'm focused on right now. The but only what? Australia, Australia, Australia. But the my my struggle right now is I have an advocate group that you know you put all your advocates into, and they're all U.S. And I'm launching. You know, I have this Australia leg coming up, and I'm finding it. You know. Is it unwise to keep your Australian advocates in a U.S. group because it's a different, you know, the promos are different and it's still the same, you know, DoTerra business that we're doing, but I, I'm, I'm going, I, st I don't know to start a different wellness advocate. Yeah, no, I think it's great to keep all your people together in the beginning because I think that a newer group gets excited by the excitement that's going on in the other group. And what I've, what I've seen is as leaders step up, they start their own groups. And so, you know, my my main group, that my main page on Facebook, my team, I'm always posting the U.S. and, and Canadian mm -hmm. promos just because that's the only ones we really hear about unless you dig, mm -hmm. right? And so... Hey, we're going to make that easy. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we post stuff and, and my Europeans know, like, that's, I'm just posting the U.S. stuff and they now yeah. do their own stuff. Okay. But, you know, they get excited by just being connected with everybody else and... I think you know just from having Americans in different states around, the, you know, when they see each other on Facebook and they meet it somewhere, it's like everybody's friends and they're excited and yeah. they feel like they know each other. So yeah, I think it's great to have, and I have a fantastic leader in, in Australia. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's a presidential diamond. She's got two presidential diamonds underneath of her now. And her whole team still wants to be in our groups mm -hmm. in addition to her group. So, okay. so yeah. there's no like confusion or anything? No, I would just maybe yeah. write when you're posting the promos, sure. U.S. and Canada only. Okay. You know, do a little digging, you can you know, figure out what the, the, I don't remember what market you said it was, Australia, Australia you know, grab theirs. And yeah. what? Australia is kind of unique um, from a good perspective is that, you know, we still have about 15 or 20 percent of our volume in Australia comes from the Aussies ordering from the U.S. So they, so they can order NFR, we call it NFR, so we have, sorry, we have lots of vernaculars, GAC, NFR means not for resale. So in some countries, Australia happens to be one. There's not a lot. Uh, Japan's another. But Australia has, has rules. It's all legal. They can order, like they can order from Amazon in the United States and get it shipped into them, right? They can order from doTERRA in the United States. They can order the promo in the United States. And they can have it shipped to them. It's just going to come straight from the United States, and it takes a week to 10 days to get there. So they can or they can get the U.S. promo yeah. and they order yeah. it? And yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Canada, okay. Too. yeah, and Canada can do the same thing. And so they can participate fully in Australia. You can't do that in a lot of countries. It's being shipped from the U.S. Yeah. And it takes an extra time, but we subsidize the shipping. So it's so expensive. I don't know, it's like 15 bucks they have to pay for shipping. But they order U.S. pricing, and they order from the U.S. So if the incentive is in Australia, like I say... Uh, <laughs> I like I to think about this. If it's like a, you know, you get 50, they get they get 50 promo. Like, oh, that's not what he's talking about. So no. I, I think what you're talking about is, okay, we're ha we've got an enrollment incentive in Australia going on, and mm -hmm. it's not go and, and the U.S. is something totally different. They're going to follow the Australian incentive. incentive yeah. yeah. What we're talking about is like, okay. you know, spend 200 get the, yeah, yeah. yeah or that. Like if you if you order in the they U.S. and you part of the U.S. Bogos or the okay. 200 PV promo. You could do both. Like if they're in Australia, they could do both. So typically, also our products are released in the U.S. first sure. before anywhere else. So like Europe does not, neither does Australia. They'll get it next month. Like they don't have anything we got at convention yet. 
Okay, all our new product releases were just in the U.S. So if they want the rose touch, you know, the on guard hands, like they have to get it in the U.S. Okay, but the they US can. The, the Australians yeah. can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whereas in other countries they can't. Okay. Okay. Right. But if yeah. we have a reactivation promo okay. here and they don't, they cannot take part of that. That's, that's what I, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Unless they okay. have Americans and then they can offer it with their people, right? Gotcha. Okay. Just want to be clear. Getting a little complicated here. <laughs> Sorry. But they're not buying from their account? They are yeah, buying they can. from their account. Australians can do that. I'm sorry. I know you're saying, why can't the Australians do that? No, no, well, then what about Canada? Because I said that in Canada, they couldn't get some things from the U.S. They can yeah, order. I mean, the like Canadians can tell me, but they, yeah. they have to know how to do it. But you can order anything from the U.S. When you go to your shop page on Canada or Australia, you have two choices. It says immediately when you log in, do you want to order you know, NFR or do you want to order? And you have to click it, and then once you click it, you're in either shopping cart. They're yes. shopping from the U.S. Yes. 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 Global access is the same. I mean, the only difference in countries is just exchange rate. I mean, we try to keep them the same, but there could be a dollar or two difference depending on how we set the exchange rate, but they're the same. Okay. Global access is exactly the same. They just pay the USD for global access. They're, they're, they're essentially joining as a US member. Okay. And they can order, if they're in the United States, they can order whatever they want. It's just, we're just not gonna ship to them. And we can't pay them, right? So that's what we so they're, they're in essence a U.S. member. So if I had to ask Kaylee, what would you say is your biggest um, mistake that you've made growing internationally that you wish you didn't make? Yeah, I've made like a million mistakes <laughs> everywhere, not just internationally. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't think that. What were you say? The whole book. Yeah, I don't think it, I don't think internationally for me has been necessarily different mistakes than the U.S. mistakes. I, I would say, in, you know, you don't have a crystal ball, but I, placement, like I didn't want to have an international leg on my front line qualifying me because I was nervous that if something happened and the market crashed or, you know, I lost my leader, like my rank would disappear. And so I, I put my international legs on my fourth level or fifth level, and you know now I'm looking at that Romanian leg down there, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, like that's definitely she's frontline material. She'll be presidential diamond. She's got you know diamonds underneath of her. She's literally the country right now. So I mean, but that's not a mistake. It's just a choice I made, and, and I've got an amazing blue diamond in Canada that I didn't know was going to be a leader, and I put her on my sixth level. So it's not a different kind of you know, situation that would happen in the U.S. I think, I think the hard thing, you know, the hard thing that we both said, Bill, internationally, is if you're not there, it's just, you can't, like I'm having a little bit, a little bit of an issue right now over there with one of my legs, and she's struggling with a little leadership, and I just wish I could just be there next week. I would do that for somebody in the U.S. if I could, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it's just harder to take that trip, so, but that's not a mistake, it's right. just a circumstance, right? Let me, if, if I had a, a group of presidentials up here, right, not just Haley. Haley, the advice she gave, the first advice she gave today was very wise, which is focus on the U.S., right? Let's, if this happens, it happens and follow a lead. But I think some of our presidentials have, would say to not go too early, okay? It, it's hard to resist that temptation. We had a lot of challenges in Mexico. And we had a lot of leaders that's close to the U.S. They wanted to get going. It was tough. It's tough in the early stages. We don't have a lot of products there yet. We're getting our management team up and trained. And you look, there are mistakes we make. I know that. And we're trying to do better. Um, yeah, we're doing okay. We're growing a lot internationally. And it's just not easy. And so in those early stages, it's hard. It's hard. And so I think... 
as a collective group, if we were to have all the presidentials up here, I think you would hear many of them say, you know, be careful to not run too early, to not make too many promises. You know, you'll hear the company, you'll hear rumors of when a country's going to open, and be real careful not to mislead your people, right? Because some things we don't control, and we're trying, right. but be, be careful, um, just because it can get a little bit out of control when you're not there to supervise it, right? And so I would just say, you just want to be careful early. Okay. Yeah, it's totally fair. I think that you know the, the, the long-term advice is if you do have a leader up and running and you've got that leader who hits whatever rank it is when you want to get there, if it's gold or platinum or diamond or whatever, at that point, my, my advice to you would be, yes, go there. Because I do think that you all know that the personal touch of having somebody with you that cares makes a huge difference. And you know, the story that I was telling Corey earlier about my Australian situation was, um, I mean, I'll go into it for a couple minutes without a lot of detail, but when I, I didn't know my leader at all. Uh, and she was doing phenomenal. She had, she had diamond in eight months. Some of you probably heard of her, Tara Bliss, right? And she, she got very sick after she hit diamond. And I saw her volume a little bit start to dwindle and I got worried and we had already booked our trip out to Australia for a convention. I was excited to meet her and I found out, you know, as we were leaving that she probably wasn't gonna be able to go to convention, which was odd because she was 20 minutes away. I mean, some of the people coming from her, a six hour flight, you know, sitting to the Gold Coast. And anyway, long story short, I was hesitant about whether I should leave. My daughter was sick at the time, my little one you just saw several years ago, and I'd never been gone that long. I'd never taken a flight that long in my life. And I did go, and I did go to the convention. She had about 30 girls there, and it was the best thing I ever did, because they felt a level of support there while their leader was missing for a little while. And uh, it, was, it was probably one of the best decisions I made in my business was to get on that plane and go, because that team rallied, and they felt, you know, they felt like, oh my gosh, we have a leader over from the home office, you know, even though I'm not in, in Utah, and they felt the support, and the team mobilized, and she came back from her illness, and she saw the true definition of what residual income really is, and how you can take a break with an emergency for a few months, and the team is still there. So that would be my advice, you know, when you do have a team strong enough. I'm not a big advocate of running off, you know, every single time you have a, a new leader pop. But, you know, Boy Truman, for example, I mean, he was going out to Asia probably every six to eight weeks in the beginning, and had he not, he, he would not have business. So I'm sure that he will, he would stand here and say, yeah, I had to do that, because they needed me on the ground to help that get going. But, you know, then you back away, and you back away, and you back away. And I, I'm, I'm still at the stage right now in my European business, because you got to remember, Europe is, is many different countries. It's not just like, going to Australia, so when I make a trip like, you know, am I, am I going to go to London, am I going to go to Amsterdam, am I going to go to Romania, I have a in Italy now, in Spain, I've got them all over, so I do still try to get to Europe every quarter, but, you know, Wes this year is like, well, do we need to go back to Australia anymore? <laughs> and, I, and I said, yeah, you know, they want to see us there, it's just once a year, you know, you, you feel that love, you feel that presence, so this is a people business, you guys. We're in the business of, of building relationships, and building relationships is not just getting people to sign up and be in your back office. That's only when the work starts, right? That's only when the work starts, when they're in your back office. So you've got to build that relationship however you can, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's on Vox, or whether it's on WhatsApp, and eventually it will be on, in person, and you may be lucky enough to be able to have international travel be part of your lifestyle, but just don't do it too soon. Great. We have uh, one final question, and then uh, maybe we'll make some final comments, and then we'll answer any other questions that anyone wants to describe. Oh, two questions. Oh, here and here. I have just another fast one. So at what point when you're traveling um, and you're generating income in the other country, do you have to pay taxes in the other country? Or how Never, does that really work? Never, pretty much. I mean, I don't want to, I deal in this a lot, okay? And there's lots of complex tax issues. But generally, unless you move to a country for a period of at least three months, usually six months, unless you move there, you don't have to pay taxes in that country, okay? You do have to pick up the income in the U.S. The U.S. has new international tax rules and it's complex, but you, you do have to pay tax generally in the U.S. There's ways to work around that too, but that's separate and I'll, I can talk to you later about that, but you don't have to pay taxes in those countries. Yeah. 
What advice do you have for someone who's in a market that's about to open? Well, advice in a market that's about to open. I mean, you, have a, you already have an organization there. I would, I would try, this is, this is me, but I would try to make sure that they start supporting the company events. That they come wherever they have to do to make the sacrifice to be at the grand opening events or the events that we're having as a company and to get them connected to the infrastructure in the country that can support them. You all know we have an amazing account management team and sales teams here, right? And in foreign countries, we don't have nearly as many people, but we still have some support teams. And if they can get connected there, that's going to be very, very helpful for them. One more question right here. I have a question. Yeah, okay, so I have one more question. No, right here. Oh, go ahead. Did you get your hand? Go ahead.
until three or four years ago, and I'm a founder in Europe. Brazil, I got a guy who's ready to go to Brazil too, and I told him, hey, I'll talk to you in April when the market opens. Like, it is not a rush to get in there today. It's gonna make you crazy, right? So wait until the market opens, and even if you are like literally standing at the ribbon cutting, and somebody else comes in three years later, doesn't mean that you had a fresh start. You know what I'm saying? You just said April. Is that for sure? <laughs> <laughs> We're hopeful. We go back I keep saying April. We have. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll just tell you. You know, we get Copaiba uh, from. I don't know how you say it, but Copaiba from Brazil. And there's a trip with some presidentials that are going down in in uh, mid-May, I think it is. And we hope to have it open by then. And that's kind of putting some pressure on. So we're hoping about that time. So it's, it's getting close. Let me just say, in conclusion, that uh, I don't want to discourage anyone to do international. We want to, I think, face the reality of what it involves, right? And, you know, we apologize, we wish it were as easy as everywhere, it's just not gonna be as easy. Having said that, we're growing very rapidly in our international market. Um, and, and to tell you specifically, last year, you know, our Australian business more than doubled, right? And it's very large and we have a lot of, you know, the consumer market's really ripe in Australia. People know about doTERRA, they're interested in natural products, interested in essential oils. And that market's done exceptionally well. Europe is now, thanks to Haley and her team and a few other teams, is on a rampage. Europe is doubling and more than doubling right now, and we're trying to keep up with it all. And Europe is a place where, I mean, there's like, count Russia, there's like a billion people, right? It's, it's big. You know, it's not like Guatemala, okay, which is, you know, 10 million or something. It's way different. So, um, you know, Brazil is something also we've been very interested in a long time. And we think we have huge opportunities in Brazil. We've spent more time in Brazil doing preparatory work. It's taken us a couple of years to get local manufacturing lined up, which just means that they're just bottling the oils there. But, and that helps us keep the tax structure down so the pricing's okay. And we've spent a long time in Brazil. We're very optimistic about, about Brazil. So, the international markets are exciting. I don't want to say that they're not, but just know what you're getting into when you go.